Did you know that even biblical characters faced internal conflicts and intense struggles with God? The story of Jacob reveals a surprising truth. Sometimes, blessings come disguised as struggle and pain. What if I told you that it's precisely in moments of greatest weakness and doubt that we find God's strength and grace? In this video, we will uncover how a night of anguish transformed Jacob into Israel, bringing not only a new identity, but also a powerful blessing. Stay with me and discover how this story can change your perspective on faith and resilience. The Man Who Wrestled With God The Extraordinary Saga of Jacob is one of the most fascinating stories told in the Bible. This narrative goes beyond recounting a life full of challenges, deceptions, and personal quests. It offers a deep reflection on the essence of faith, human struggle, and spirituality. Jacob's life mirrors our own journeys, showing how moments of great adversity can become opportunities for a true encounter with the divine. From his birth, marked by a premonition of rivalries, to the iconic struggle in the middle of the night, where he confronts not only a physical opponent, but also the essence of his soul. The rivalry between the two brothers foreshadowed the two nations that would arise from them. Jacob would become the patriarch of Israel and Esau of Edom, as recorded in Genesis 36. Additionally, Esau, the older brother, would become the servant of Jacob, the younger brother, according to Genesis 25, 23. Genesis 25 tells the story of Abraham's son Isaac's lineage. Abraham became the father of Isaac, who was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she consulted the Lord, who answered, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will separate from within you. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came to give birth, there were twins in her womb. The first to come out was reddish, and his whole body was like a hairy cloak, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother emerged with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob preferred to stay at home among the tents. Jacob is first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 25, when his mother Rebekah was pregnant with him and his twin brother Esau. She asked God why her babies were struggling within her. Isaac, who favored wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah favored Jacob. One day, while Jacob was preparing a stew, Esau came in from the field, famished, and said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am famished. Thus Esau was also called Edom. Jacob is depicted in the Bible as a character associated with deceit and trickery. From his birth to his wrestle with God, narrated in Genesis 32, 24, 29, Jacob's most notorious deceit was against his twin brother Esau. In exchange for the birthright, which entitled the firstborn to a double portion of their father Isaac's inheritance. Jacob offered Esau, who was famished, a bowl of stew. According to Genesis 25, 29, 34, Esau, coming in exhausted from the field, said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Look, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob insisted, swear to me first. So Esau swore an oath, selling his birthright to Jacob. Thus Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, which he ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Furthermore, Jacob deprived Esau of his father's blessing, which Esau was supposed to receive, according to Genesis 27, 1, 29. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called his older son Esau and said, My son, Esau replied, Here I am. 
Isaac said, I am now an old man and do not know the day of my death. Now take your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out into the field and hunt some game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food that I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau went out to the field to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a tasty dish for me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, so I can prepare a tasty dish for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to his mother Rebekah, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, while I have smooth skin. But if my father touches me, he will realize I'm trying to deceive him, and I'll bring a curse on myself instead of a blessing, he said. His mother replied, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went, got them, and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of her older son Esau, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goatskins. Then she handed Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. Jacob went to his father and said, My father. Isaac answered, Yes, my son. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? He replied, The Lord your God gave me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Jacob approached his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? he asked. I am, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said, Bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate, and he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Give water to the sheep and go back to pasture, he said. But they replied, We can't until all the flocks are gathered, and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will give water to the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, he approached, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, 
and watered his uncle Laban's flock. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father Laban. Laban said to him, You are my bone and my flesh. Jacob stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Just because you are my relative, should you work for me for free? Tell me, what should be your salary? Laban had two daughters. The name of the eldest was Leah, and the name of the youngest was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful in shape and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you for seven years in exchange for the privilege of marrying Rachel, his youngest daughter. Laban replied, It is better that I give it to you in marriage than to another man. So Jacob served Laban for seven years to be able to marry Rachel, but those years seemed only a few days to him because of his love for her. Finally, Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time of service is complete that I may take her as my wife. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife as well. Laban gave his servant Bilhar to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. Despite his love for Rachel, Jacob was deceived into marrying Leah. However, Jacob persisted and eventually married the love of his life. Jacob worked for Laban for many years, and through God's protection and his own cunning, managed to acquire a good share of Laban's livestock for himself. Eventually, God told Jacob to return to his father's land. The problem was that this meant facing Esau. Would his brother's anger still burn after all these years? Knowing Jacob's story is to understand that his life was full of ups and downs. Despite God's promise to Jacob that he would not only become a great nation, but many nations, he was a fearful and anxious man. Jacob was about to encounter his brother Esau, who had sworn to kill him. At a critical moment in his life, all of Jacob's efforts and fears were about to come to fruition. Jacob fled from an enraged Laban only to face his furious brother Esau. Fearing for his life, Jacob devised a bribe and sent a caravan of gifts across the Jabbok River with his wives and children in hopes of appeasing his brother. He was stripped of all his worldly possessions, physically exhausted, alone in the wilderness and facing certain death. In reality, he had no control over his destiny. On the banks of the Jabbok River, he fell into a deep sleep with his father-in-law behind him and Esau ahead, too exhausted to fight. But it was then that his true struggle began. Escaping his family history had already been difficult enough. Wrestling with God himself was an entirely different matter. That night, Jacob was visited by an angelic stranger. Genesis 32, 22, 23. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Jacob had struggled his whole life. From the moment of his birth, he had been in conflict with Esau. Later, he clashed with Laban. Just before encountering Esau, Jacob faced the toughest moment of his life. The one who had once grasped his brother's heel was now grappling with the very physical form of God himself. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, 
Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Note that Jacob was 79 years old at this point in the narrative. It is unlikely he posed a significant physical challenge to an angel. While there is no reason to doubt a physical confrontation occurred, we should not mistake this for the main point. The text tells us Jacob's opponent could not defeat him, not that Jacob was physically dominating the man. The ease with which the man inflicts physical harm on Jacob suggests the struggle was more symbolic and spiritual. Jacob indicates any disability must be in the spiritual realm, not physical. If the wrestler cannot defeat Jacob spiritually, it is because Jacob is not willing to yield. Only when the man threatens to leave without offering assurances of God's assistance does Jacob show his willingness to negotiate critical issues. The turning point occurs when Jacob informs the stranger that he will not let him go unless these assurances are provided. This indicates Jacob's willingness to submit to God's demands on him. Jacob's perseverance is now working in his favor as he is willing to go all the way. The blessing manifests in the form of a name change, which is significant for Jacob, as his name became synonymous with his character throughout history. A name change, therefore, denotes a change of character. Changing someone's name was a way to exert authority over that person. Jacob accepts the name change, which is equivalent to accepting a change of character. In this case, the new name is intended to represent Jacob's transformation. One of Jacob's traditional strengths, his perseverance, has brought him success in his interactions with people and now accounts for his success in his struggle with God. Not because God surrendered, but because Jacob surrendered, as is customary with God, who first loses to then win. Jacob's request for the wrestler's name may be a final effort to maintain control, but the wrestler refuses. Who exactly is this stranger? Throughout the episode, the narrator refers to him as a man, but at the end of the episode, he is called Elohim. The man injures Jacob's hip, but Jacob refuses to let him go until the place is blessed. Jacob realizes he was not wrestling with a man, but with God, and he would not give up until the site was blessed. In this case, the new name is intended to represent Jacob's transformation. One of Jacob's traditional strengths, his perseverance, has brought him success in his interactions with people and now accounts for his success in his struggle with God. Not because God surrendered, but because Jacob surrendered, as is customary with God, who first loses to then win. Jacob's request for the wrestler's name may be a final effort to maintain control, but the wrestler refuses. Who exactly is this stranger? Throughout the episode, the narrator refers to him as a man, but at the end of the episode, he is called Elohim. The man injures Jacob's hip, but Jacob refuses to let him go until the place is blessed. Jacob realizes he was not wrestling with a man, but with God, and he would not give up until the sight was blessed. Only God's mercy can forgive us, and only God's grace can take us to the other side of the night. Secondly, God honors perseverance, especially in our pursuit of him. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, wrenching it while they wrestled. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Genesis 32, 25, 26. Jacob possessed two admirable traits, one of them being spiritual sensitivity. This was seen when he fled from his brother and saw the ladder to heaven 
and again when he obeyed the voice of the Lord telling him to return to his homeland. His perseverance is exemplified in his pursuit of Rachel and his patience in serving Laban to win her hand in marriage. In his struggle with the mysterious man, Jacob exemplifies both qualities. He recognized that he was wrestling with God and refused to give up until God blessed him. What made this struggle even more powerful were the moral ramifications Jacob faced. He did not deserve the blessing, but was willing to accept whatever judgment or consequence came with it. The ramifications were not insignificant. The fight left him limping, but Jacob received his blessing. Thirdly, our identity is in God. The man asked Jacob, what is your name? And he answered, Jacob. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because as a prince you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Genesis 32, 27, 28. Jacob came from an interesting family. He was a descendant of those who would multiply into many nations through the faith of his grandfather, Abraham. He inherited some of his grandmother, Sarah's envy, and went through many challenges and conflicts. A bit of his mother's cunning humor and some of his father's loyalty, he was named Supplanter at birth and lived up to that name. Jacob was a selfish man in his early years. He was partially transformed by his love for Rachel and his loyalty to her family, but it was in his struggle with God that he reached a turning point. He was baptized as Israel, Prince of God, signifying a new identity. In the Bible, God does this countless times, giving new names and new identities. Every new believer receives the same treatment from Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 As we continue reading Genesis, we see Jacob's name changing from the old to the new throughout his life. God reminds Jacob of his new name once again in Genesis 35, 10. This is something that often happens to us. God calls us his beloved, a new creation in him, but we forget who we are. We must cling to our new identity. After wrestling with God, we may make mistakes and lose sight of who we are, but we can always return to what God has called us to be. God wants us to know him intimately. Jacob asked God, Please tell me your name. And God answered, Why do you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Genesis 32, 29. Jacob understood who God was. He knew that God was the God of his father and grandfather, but the God with whom Jacob wrestled at Jabbok became the God of his heart. Many people are aware of God, but have never had a genuine transformative encounter with him. Understanding what God did for others is not the same as understanding what he has done for you. God is much more concerned with the state of our hearts than how well we appear to live a righteous life. Spending time with God is crucial to truly knowing him. The only way to have a deep relationship with God is through reading the Bible, prayer, and worship with our hearts and minds fully focused on him. This draws us closer to his presence the greatest obstacle to spending time with God is sometimes ourselves with our confused priorities. I know that starting my day by dedicating time to God's word and or praying makes the rest of the day smoother. The events of my day may not change, but my attitude changes because God's peace is with me. Drawing near to God requires humility. The sun rose upon him as he crossed over Penuel and he was limping because of his hip. Genesis 32, 31. This physical disability was a sign of his newfound humility. For proud, self-sufficient, quick-thinking Jacob, it was a transformation. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines humility as freedom from pride or arrogance. In today's world, humility may seem countercultural and counter to success. But in God's kingdom, we become better when we set aside our pride and trust in him. God humbled many biblical figures, including Jacob. Similar stories can be found in the conversion of Simon Peter and Saul to Paul. 
Paul later wrote about a thorn in the flesh to keep him from becoming conceited because of the great revelations he received. He said, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 10 No one would want to go through life with a disability or illness to remain humble, but God knows what we need. Our dependence on Him, not ourselves, is our greatest strength. The sun was rising upon Jacob as he limped. He had a new disability, but also a new identity, a new name, and a new intimacy with God. God wants to bless you. When he makes us struggle for some blessings, it's not because he's reluctant to bless us. Although it may seem so initially, it's because he has more blessings for us in the struggle than when we don't struggle. Remember that God sought Jacob for this fight. God was the catalyst. When God appeared, Jacob was consumed by his own anxiety about Esau and the impending confrontation. The struggle took Jacob out of his trance of fear and forced him to focus on God. I doubt Jacob wanted or even thought he needed that forced focus initially. I wouldn't be surprised if Jacob had prayed at first, God, could you get rid of this guy? This is exactly what I don't need right now. But what he discovered was that the struggle was a channel for God's blessing upon him. The same can be said for us. Keep fighting. What do you really need from God right now? Don't let God go until he blesses you. In your distress, fear and uncertainty, God will meet you no matter what. He may not meet you in the way you expect or desire. Your greatest ally may seem your opponent at first, prompting you to wrestle with him. If so, remember Jacob. There are countless benefits to struggling. You may not need soothing words of comfort, alone time with your thoughts, sleep, or maybe even a healthy hip. What you need is God's favor. When God invites you to wrestle with Him in prayer, it's an invitation to receive His blessing. Stand firm with Him and don't give up. Don't let Him go until He blesses you. He loves to bless tenacious faith, and you will be transformed as a result. Today, like Jacob, we can enter into a relationship with Christ by confessing our sins and declaring God as our Savior and Redeemer. God can give us a new life as His children, by admitting our frailty before Him, we can enter into an eternal relationship with Him, filled with His blessings and good promises for our lives. Through His new name, Israel, Jacob was able to experience a new identity. Similarly, when we encounter Christ, we undergo a transformation. Everything changes, our lives, our thoughts, our actions, and so on. We can also learn from Jacob's story that people in the Bible wrestled with God in ways that were not just physical. There is nothing wrong with having questions and wanting to know more about the Bible. Christian faith is not blind, but is based on how God has provided for us in the past. We can wrestle with Him and still come out with a new identity and blessings through the struggle. Remember what God did when he wrestled with Jacob. Jacob spent the night anticipating Esau's arrival. He was terrified and desperate, but emerged from the night with God's blessing and renewed faith. All our struggles based on faith with God lead to peace. When we need God's comfort, sometimes he sends it in unexpected and even unwanted packages. If necessary, God will make us limp to strengthen our faith. God even inflicted a debilitating injury on Jacob, making him even more vulnerable to Esau, forcing Jacob's faith to rely more fully on God than on himself. If necessary, God will weaken us to strengthen our faith. Ultimately, Jacob's identity was transformed as a result of his struggle with God. He would no longer be remembered as someone who obtained his blessing through deceit. He received God's blessing this time because he prevailed with God through faith. This struggle proved to be a deeply gracious gift of restoration from God, akin to the gift Jesus gave to Peter 
allowing him to affirm his love for Jesus as many times as he denied him. Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Again, for the second time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. For the third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. John 21, 15, 17. God was pleased with Jacob's tenacious faith and granted him the blessing he sought. Hebrews 11, 6. When God calls us to wrestle with him, there's always more going on than we perceive, and God always uses it to transform us for the better. In modern society, we celebrate wealth, power, strength, confidence, prestige, and victory. We disdain and fear weakness, failure, and doubt. While we recognize that vulnerability, fear, and discouragement are normal parts of life, we often interpret these feelings as signs of failure or lack of faith. We also know that naive optimism and glowing praise of glamour and success are recipes for discontentment and despair. In real life, most of us will face the cold, hard realism of life sooner or later. Jacob's story brings us back to reality. One of the most widely read Christian authors, Frederick Buchner, describes Jacob's divine encounter at the Jabbok River as the magnificent defeat of the human soul at the hands of God. We can easily recognize our own wrestling elements in Jacob's story. Fears, darkness, loneliness, vulnerabilities, feelings of helplessness, exhaustion, and relentless pain. Even the Apostle Paul felt discouragement and fear. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. 2 Corinthians 7, 5. In reality, God does not want to abandon us in our trials, fears, and battles in life. In life's conflicts, we learn that God provides a corresponding divine gift that we can only receive through Him. The power of conversion and transformation as well as the gift not only of surrender but also of freedom, perseverance, faith, and courage. Finally, Jacob does what we all must do. He confronts his failures, weaknesses, sins, and all that is hurting him, and he confronts God. Jacob wrestled with God all night long. Only after he reconciled with God and stopped fighting, acknowledging that he could not go on without him, did he receive God's blessing, Genesis 32, 29. This remarkable incident in Jacob's life teaches us that our lives were never meant to be easy. This is especially true when we decide to wrestle with God and his will for our lives on our own. We also learn that as Christians, despite our trials and tribulations, our efforts in this life are never without God's presence, and His blessing inevitably follows the struggle, which can be confusing and chaotic at times. True growth experiences are always accompanied by struggle and pain. Jacob's wrestle with God at the Jabbok on that dark night reminds us of this truth. While we may oppose God and His will for us, God is truly very good. As Christians, we may wrestle with him through the loneliness of the night, but his blessing comes at dawn. In Genesis 33, 1, 12, Jacob looked up and saw that Esau was coming with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. Esau looked up and saw the women and children and asked, Who are these with you? Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. 
Finally, Joseph and Rachel came and also bowed down. Esau asked, What is the meaning of all these flocks and herds I have encountered? Jacob replied, To find favor in your eyes, my lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Take what is yours. Jacob insisted, Please, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me, for seeing your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have welcomed me. Please accept the gift that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have everything I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted. So Esau said, Let's move on, I will accompany you. But Jacob replied, You know, my lord, that children are small, and that I must tend the herds and lactating herds. If they are driven hard for just one day, all the flocks will die. Esau said, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that? Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. When Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Jacob met his brother Esau after his struggle. Instead of killing him, his brother received him with a hug and tears of joy. Esau reconciled with his brother and Jacob was spared from death. Esau wanted nothing from the possessions Jacob offered him, although he accepted them at Jacob's insistence. He just wanted to be on good terms with his brother. The rest of Jacob's story is not a happy ending. He would eventually lose his beloved wife Rachel during childbirth, and his favorite son Joseph would be sold into slavery after being betrayed by his older brothers. Jacob's life came to an end in a foreign land. Despite everything, God reminds Jacob that he is with him and that his promises are true, even though Jacob cannot see how they are possible at that moment. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Which parts of Jacob's story do you identify with as you read about his struggle? At what point in your life are you? Do you need to ask for forgiveness? Are you seeking a relationship with God with tenacity? How can you draw near to Him? By remaining humble, we can grow, have more peace, and become the person God has called us to be. When we learn the lessons God has for us from the stories in His Word, we are transformed. Thank you for being here and may God bless you.